Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man walah. Amma ba'du fa'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa minan nasi man yaqulu amanna billahi wa bil yawmil akhiri wa ma hum bi mu'minin. Sadaqallahul azim. We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking Allah's blessings upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his companions and all of the believers. Today, inshallah, we're going to be covering the history of the munafiqeen, the story of the hypocrites and their emergence in the city of Medina Munawwara. In the past few sessions, we spoke about the internal struggles that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faced in the city of Medina, specifically with the neighboring Jewish communities. Another group emerged that were antagonistic and hostile towards the Muslims, known as the hypocrites, the munafiqeen. And I'm sure everyone sitting here, everybody listening online, has heard numerous references to the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So it's important for us to understand who they were, why they emerged, how they emerged, the circumstances surrounding their emergence and how they impacted the Muslim community. So today, inshallah, we're going to be spending a few minutes on that because we're still speaking about the earlier years in Medina Munawwara. And in order to understand some of the ghazawat and the expeditions and the incidences that occur after this period, it's important to understand the different groups that resided in Medina Munawwara and their relationship to the Muslims. So, this is also important because numerous verses in the Quran address this group. One major theme in the Quran is dialectics, apologetics, responding to deviant groups. Responding to their arguments with evidences and proof. Four major groups have been addressed. The idol worshippers, the Jews, the Christians, and also the hypocrites. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to contend with these four different groups. In Mecca, his primary opponents were the idol worshippers who continued their hostility even after Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's migration to Medina. And in the earlier Medinan period, and continuously throughout his Medinan life, two groups were his primary opponents. One was the Jewish community, and one was the Mushrik, the Munafiqeen, the hypocrites. And then during that Medinan period, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has some interactions with Christians. So these four groups have been primarily addressed in the Qur'an. From all four of them, the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, posed the greatest threat. And the reason why they posed the greatest threat to the Prophet ﷺ is because a hypocrite is one who says one thing and does another. They outwardly expressed their faith in Islam, but inwardly, they were scheming against the Muslims. So their threat was greater than the threat of those who were open opponents. Because they're hiding their true beliefs. They're hiding their true nature, the reality, who they really are. So let's speak about the history of the munafiqeen. So the word munafiqeen or munafiqoon is the plural of the word munafiq. And munafiq comes from the letters nafaqah. In this context, we're speaking about a group or a person that displays something contrary to what is in their heart. Meaning they display faith and iman, but inwardly they're concealing kufr and disbelief. So this is what we mean when we say the word munafiq. Someone who outwardly expresses that they are Muslim, 
inwardly they are not Muslim. Now, what were their characteristics? There are numerous characteristics mentioned about them in the Quran and also the ahadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're going to list a few of them. But one thing to remember is that the mention of munafiqeen in the Quran and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's interaction with this type of people or group only happens in Medina, not in Mecca. Because in Mecca there were no munafiqeen. In Mecca there were idol worshippers. And to the contrary, there were Muslims who had to hide their faith because there was fear. Right? So let's understand this. There were no munafiqeen in the Meccan period. The munafiqeen only emerged in the Medinan period. Because in the, in the Meccan period, Muslims were a small number. They weren't powerful. There was no need to scheme against them from within. There was no need to plot against them from within. And in, instead, some Muslims had to hide their faith because of hostility in order to secure their life and to protect their life. So the characteristics that Allah reveals about the munafiqeen are all Medinan verses or Medinan references. However, when the Prophet Wasallam migrates to Medina Munawwara, he finds a group known as the Ansar, who we call the helpers, who had already embraced Islam before Nabi Wasallam's arrival. And they were primarily made up of two major tribes, Aus and Khazraj. Majority of them had entered Islam. Some of them had not yet entered Islam. Then, of course, we know about the three major Jewish tribes that resided in Medina Munawwara. Banu Nadir, Banu Quraidha, and Banu Qaynuqar. From the Jewish community, only a very few had accepted Islam, while the majority were still remained, or had still remained upon their faith of uh, Judaism. During the earlier stages in Medina, also there were no hypocrites. So there were no hypocrites in Mecca, and even during the earlier stages in Medina, there were no hypocrites. Why? Because Muslims had not yet gained strength. When Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam migrates to Medina Munawwara, one of the first things he does, as mentioned in the previous lessons, was he consolidates support and he establishes peace and harmony between the different groups that resided there. The Jewish community, the Arab tribes, the Muslims, they all entered a charter known as the Constitution of Medina, the Mithaq of Medina. Muslims were not yet a strong force. But after the Battle of Badr, when the Muslims had inflicted a devastating blow to the Quraysh, Quraysh who were recognized as one of the sovereign tribes of Arabia and Muslims had defeated them in the battle of Badr we're going to learn about that inshallah as we go along this sent out a major signal to the rest of Arabia that this group is not one to mess with this group is rising, it's growing, it's emerging and soon if they are not stopped in their tracks they will become supreme and sovereign in the entire Hijaz Peninsula. So it was at that time that Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul, who was a leader in Medina before Islam, it's important to understand about Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul. Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul belonged to the Khazraj tribe, from the two major Arab tribes that resided in Medina. Before Islam, we mentioned a few sessions ago, that these two major tribes were at war with each other before Islam. And finally they had a truce and one of the matters that they agreed upon after the truce in order to strengthen the ties between the two tribes was to appoint Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul as the leader of Medina. He should be crowned the prince of Medina. He will rule over all of us. So Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul became threatened, extremely threatened, when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa arrives 
when a major portion of his tribe become Muslim and they start to adhere to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they start to elevate him and they start to follow him deeply. This posed a major threat to his sovereignty, to his aspirations for leadership, his asp aspirations for being the Prince of Medina. So what happens is, when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam succeeds in the Battle of Badr, he becomes threatened and he realizes that Islam is here to stay. But he was still a staunch enemy of Islam in his heart. He hated it. He hated the fact that this man, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, arrives in Medina, takes the limelight away from him, when he was supposed to be appointed the Prince of Medina, the King of Medina, the leader of Medina. But he understands and realizes that this religion he can't remove. He can't remove the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what does he do? He starts to scheme and plot from within. He outwardly expresses faith in Islam, but inwardly, internally, He's a staunch enemy of Islam. And in adopting this type of stance, he believed that he would galvanize more people and he would become allies of the Quraysh of Mecca. And through their alliance, they will be able to remove the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They'll be able to remove the Muslims. So this was his plan. So just to remember that Munafiqeen did not come from the immigrants. None of the migrants that migrated with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were munafiqeen. Na'udhu Billah. And the munafiqeen that did emerge, emerged in the city of Medina. Now we're also going to speak about two different types of munafiqeen. Because if we study the verses in Surah Al-Baqarah, and Surah Al-Baqarah is very interesting when it begins. At the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah speaks about three different groups. He speaks about the believers in the first few verses. Then he speaks about the disbelievers, clear disbelievers in two verses. And then there are approximately 13 verses about the munafiqeen. Right? So, five about the believers, two about the disbelievers, and about 13 verses about the hypocrites. So when Allah speaks about the hypocrites in Surah Al-Baqarah, he describes two different groups amongst the hypocrites. So in the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi there were two different groups of hypocrites. One group was strong on their kufr, on their disbelief. They had no skepticism or doubt. Outwardly, Muslim. Internally, staunch kafir, staunch disbeliever, staunch hater, staunch opponent of Islam. Then there was a second group that was weak. They knew Islam was true, but they did not want to pledge their allegiance to Islam. They were still waiting to see what happens. Will the Muslims become successful? Will Islam rise? If it does, I'll benefit from its glory. But if Islam is defeated, if the Prophet ﷺ is defeated, I can always go back to my friends and say, I was always with you. We knew this was going to happen. So there are people in constant wavering. Taraddud, tadabdhub. Allah describes them in Surah An-Nisa. Mudhabdhabina bayna thalik. La ilaha ula wa la ilaha ula. They are constantly wavering between the two groups. Sometimes they're with the Muslims. Sometimes they're with the disbelievers. Neither, nor are they here, nor are they there, Allah says. يُرَاءُونَ nas وَلَا يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا They show people that they are faithful. They pray with everybody. But they remember Allah seldom. They don't really remember Allah. So these verses of the Qur'an are very interesting. I'm going to go through the verses because the verses are beautiful. And it describes the two different groups. Allah says, and from the people, there are some who say we believe in Allah when in reality they don't believe. Allah negates the iman. Which brings me to another point, 
which is do munafiqeen and hypocrites exist today or did they cease with the ending of revelation it's an interesting question so in order to understand that we need to understand that there were two ways of knowing a hypocrite one way of knowing a hypocrite was through wahi and revelation Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa would receive a revelation from Allah identifying a hypocrite in his community such and such person is a hypocrite Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa didn't openly wage a war against that group because it would have caused huge chaos and instability in the city of Medina so Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa would be informed that such and such individual is a hypocrite now it's interesting because Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu he was always afraid that his name would be on that list Allah had given Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the names of the hypocrites and that list belonged to a sahabi companion by the name of Hudhayfa ibn al-Yaman Hudhayfa ibn al-Yaman was known to be the keeper of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's secrets so whenever a hypocrite would die Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was instructed not to pray their janazah so Hudhayfa bin Yaman, so Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu used to ask Hudhayfa, is my name on that list? Allahu anhu is a staunch believer, the strongest, but he was fearful and cautious. So at a janazah and a funeral, he would look out to see if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was present or not. If Hudhayfa is present or not, because they had that knowledge. Allah had given Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that knowledge which he handed over to Hudhayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu. So that was one way of knowing the hypocrites in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Of course we know that revelation ended with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa demise. So to identify a hypocrite via revelation after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa passing is impossible. The second way of recognizing a munafiq still remains. That is by identifying their characteristics. Their characteristics have been mentioned in the Quran and in numerous ahadith. We're going to mention a few of them in a few minutes, inshallah. So if a person exhibits that type of behavior on a continuous basis, that person can still be labeled a munafiqeen. But since we don't have revelation to confirm whether that person is a munafiq or not, we don't go around making those statements unless somebody openly, openly antag is antagonistic towards Islam, claiming to be a Muslim or betraying Islam. Then we can say this person is, in the Quranic terminology, mulhid or zindiq in the hadith terminology. These are two different terms used for these types of people, backstabbing the ummah, backstabbing Islam. Openly mocking Islam, even though they claim to be Muslim, so on and so forth. So Allah says, from the people there are many who say that we believe in Allah on the final day, but in reality they are not believers. They think that they are fooling Allah and the believers, but they do not fool anyone but themselves, while they know not. In their heart there is sickness, the sickness of doubt, the sickness of disbelief, the sickness of jealousy towards the Muslims. So Allah increases them in their sickness. That means that Allah gives them a chance. He gives them respite. He doesn't reveal a punishment upon them instantly. He allows them a chance to remedy and fix their ways. But if they don't, وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْذِبُونَ they will receive a tormenting punishment for the lies that they committed. When they are told, لا تفسدوا في الأرض Don't cause corruption on the earth. They say we are not, none but those who are committed to peace. Does that sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? It does. We're your friends. We love you Muslims. But then behind your back, stabbing, that's nifaq, 
open hypocr- hypocrisy and Muslims are too blind sometimes to realize. We're too blind. Oh, he said, inshallah. Oh, mashallah. He said, inshallah. So now he loves Muslims and he's the, the best candidate for Islam and Muslims. <laughs> right? So this, is, this is our attitude as Muslims. We're so weak in identifying who is and who isn't. Right? So, when they are told, don't cause corruption on earth, they say, we are peacemakers. Allah says, listen, they are the corrupt ones and the mischief makers, but they don't know. They are the mischief makers, but they don't know. Now, let's not assume that only kufr is mischief, only uh, murder is mischief, only theft and robbery is mischief. Their behavior was far more mischievous because it's a greater fitna. It destabilizes the Muslims completely. Hypocrisy. Their jealousy, their hatred, their rancor that they had in their heart has the potential to completely destabilize Islam and Muslims. So that is a greater facade and a greater corruption, Allah says. They are the mischief makers, but they do not know. They don't realize. Allah then goes on to say, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ آمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ النَّاسِ قَالُوا أَنُؤْمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ السُّفَهَاء When they are told, bring faith, like the Sahaba have brought faith, they say, should we bring faith like the foolish people? This is another trait of the munafiqeen. This is another trait of the hypocrites. They have a delusion of grandeur. We're better. If what these people are believing in was better, we would have surpassed them to it. We would have won the race. We would have been the forerunners. In another place in the Quran, Allah says regarding disbelievers, when they say to the believers, that if faith was good, they would never have beat us to it. We would have been there first because we recognize good. They don't recognize good. We have a clearer conscience. We have a clearer moral compass. Subhanallah. Right. So this because the, the, their criteria is their criteria is weak. Our criteria is revelation. Our criteria is the word of Allah. Goodness, badness. That is Allah. What Allah determines as good as bad. Anyway, so Allah says when they are told, bring faith like the people brought faith, which. At a deeper level, at a deeper level, based on our Islamic creed and aqidah, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, kulluhum adul, all of them are credible because Allah referenced their iman and said they are the criteria of iman. So think about this, inshallah, at another level. Allah then says, Allah innahum musafaha. The people that they're calling foolish, the Sahaba, no, no, no. They are foolish, but they don't know. Then Allah mentions their traits. وَإِذَا لَقُلْ لَذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا When they meet the believers, they say, we believe. وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَىٰ شَيَاطِينِهِمْ But then when they meet the devils from their friends, they say, we're with you. إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْتَهْزِئُونَ We were only joking and messing with the Muslims. We were only playing with them. Allah يَسْتَهْزِئُ بِهِمْ Allah plays with them. Allah jokes with them. Of course, Allah does not joke. There's no jest in Allah's speech. Allah does not play. But the ulama said, Al jaza'u min jinsil amal. That the retribution is from the same genre or the same type of the act. So the acts of this is mocking Muslims, uh, making a fun of Muslims, trying to fool Muslims. Allah says he does the same to you. وَيَمُدُّهُمْ فِي طُغْيَانِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ And Allah gives them respite in their rebellion. Let them wander around blindly. This is how the ulama have interpreted this. Allah stretches them in their rebellion, meaning Allah gives them time. We should never ever think, brothers and sisters, we should never ever think that such and such person is on truth because Allah has given them money because Allah has given them sovereignty, because Allah has given them power. Just because they have power, wealth, sovereignty, rule, kingdom, whatever it is, that's not the criteria for being on the truth. 
Sometimes Allah gives. This is called istidraj. min haythu la ya'lamun wa umli lahum inna kaydi mateen. Istidraj means Allah gives respite. Because if Allah wanted to, He could punish all of us because of our sins. Even we wouldn't be safe, even though we're believers. But if Allah had wanted to, He could have punished us. But He gives us respite. Redeem yourself, come back. I'll show you signs, I'll give you proof. The Messenger will bring revelation to you, the revelation will be recited unto you. My signs are manifest everywhere. Come back. Come to the truth. Come to the truth. Allah then says, These are the people that have purchased misguidance in exchange for guidance. Meaning Allah gave them the signs. A messenger came to them. He invited them directly, face to face. He recited the words of Allah unto them. But they decided to Purchase misguidance in exchange for guidance. فَمَا رَبِحَتْ تِجَارَتُهُمْ Allah says they trade didn't profit them. This calculation they made, that if I continue being with the disbelievers, then the Muslims will be overpowered soon and I can go back to my disbeliever friends and family members and tribes and so on and so forth. Allah says this trade of theirs did not profit them. وَمَا كَانُوا مُهْتَدِينَ And they were not guided. Then Allah gives us two parables. Two parables that are speaking about the two different groups from the munafiqeen. As I mentioned earlier, one group was those who were staunchly on kufr internally. And one of them were wavering. Not sure. One day with the Muslims, one day with the non-Muslims. When the Muslims are victorious siding with them so they can get from the spoils of war but when the muslims experience defeat or testing times like in the battle of uhud then they say oh we told you so you don't have to why did you put us through this loss of life loss of this loss of that and sometimes brothers and sisters we hear these types of statements from muslims as well but why did they do that oh you oh, shouldn't do it. Oh, oh. Everybody becomes a commentator, right? A pundit. Okay, so this is the thing. We, so we have to remember. Anyway, Allah says, مَثَلُهُمْ كَمَثَلِ الَّذِي اسْتَوْقَدَ نَارًا Their example is like the example of an individual that kindles a fire. فَلَمَّا أَضَاءَتْ مَا حَوْلَهُ ذَهَبَ اللَّهُ بِنُورِهِمْ وَتَرَكَهُمْ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ اللَّهِ يُبْصِرُونَ When that fire brightens up their surroundings, Allah then suddenly takes their light from them and leaves them in their darknesses and they can't see. What Allah is saying here is that these munafiqeen, some of them know that Islam is true. So Allah gives them that feeling in their heart that Islam is true, which is akin to a fire or something that's bright. It lights up their surroundings, they feel good about it, but then suddenly Allah takes it from them, now they're left in darkness. So Allah says this is the condition of the munafiqeen who are staunchly opponents or staunchly opposing Islam, they are hell-bent on their kufr and their disbelief. They hate Muslims, they hate Islam. But they only show it outwardly that they are Muslims. Allah says He takes them from that light, leaves them in dark, or takes the light away from them, seizes it from them, leaves them in their darknesses so they can't see. They can't see because Allah takes away the foresight from them. Allah takes away insight into truth. Allah takes away that basara of iman okay there's two things basara and basira they both mean the same thing in english vision or sight or insight but basara is the, the eyes that you have physical eyes basira is having a spiritual insight so allah takes that away from them they might be able to see but they can't see deeply then Allah describes them again. Summum bukmun umyun fahum la yarji'un. They are death, deaf, dumb, and blind. They will never come back to the right path. Similar to what Allah says about the disbelievers in some of the previous verses, Allah has sealed their hearts, sealed their ears, 
and upon their eyes there are veils. Similar to that. So Allah says in other parts of the Quran, they have hearts but they don't really comprehend. They have ears but they can't really hear. They have eyes but they can't really see. Allah says they're worse than animals. They're like animals, rather they are more misguided than them. They are people that are heedless. Allah then goes on to speak about the second group. The second group is like a downpour of rain. Now rain when it comes down hard, sometimes there's darkness in it, sometimes there's thunder, sometimes it's accompanied by light. Three things. Now the darkness can be akin to the darkness of their kufr and disbelief. And the thunder can be akin to the anxiety and fear that they have. This is speaking about the second group. They're anxious. They're wavering. Sometimes with Muslims, sometimes with the disbelievers. But sometimes they feel like believers. So they have like lightning, which is light. They have that as well. But when they walk out, They thrust their fingers into their ears out of fear of the thunder lap, the sound of thunder. So they're afraid, they're walking like this. So they're, they're always afraid, they're not sure what's going to happen to the Muslims. Allah says He will encompass all of them. He will grab all of them. Perhaps the light will seize their vision. Whenever the light brightens for them, they walk in it. Meaning whenever the Muslims are successful, they walk along with them. Yeah, we're with you. وَإِذَا أَظْلَمَ عَلَيْهِمْ قَامُوا But when that light becomes dark upon them, meaning the light ceases, then they stand still. وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَا ذَهَبَ بِسَمْعِهِمْ وَأَبْصَارِهِمْ If Allah wishes, He will take their hearing and also their visions. إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Indeed, Allah is powerful over everything. So, brothers and sisters, what we're learning in these verses are the descriptions of the different types of hypocrites that existed in the time of Rasulullah and Allah's address to them. Now, based on these and the different categorizations that we've mentioned, we can say that there are two types of munafiqeen. One is munafiq of i'tiqad and one is munafiq of amal. I'tiqad means belief and amal means practice. So some are munafiq of i'tiqad and amal. Meaning they are hypo- hypocrites in their actions and hypocrites in their creed and belief. And some are only hypocrites in their action. So that allows us to understand that even in today's day and age, one of us could harbor a habit of a munafiq. In the hadith, Rasulullah says, Ayatul munafiqi thalath. There are three signs of a hypocrite. When he speaks, he tells lies. وَإِذَا وَعَدَ أَخْلَفَ When he makes a promise, he betrays it. He breaks it. وَإِذَا تُمِنَ خَانَ When he's entrusted with anything, whether it's information, whether it's a possession, a physical object, then he breaches that trust. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi says, if a person has one trait, he's one third. If he has two traits, he ha- he's two thirds. If he has all three traits, then he's a complete munafiq. So that allows us to understand, brothers and sisters, that if somebody has a habit like this, now of course everybody tells a liar now and then, every now I'm not saying it's justified, it's still haram to lie. But if somebody's habitually a liar, we can say for sure this person is one third munafiq. But don't make that judge, don't go around making that judgment. I'm not saying that, so we go around saying, hey, that person's a munafiq. Think about yourself. Do I fall in any one of those categories? Am I safe? Am I secure? Because we're not necessarily safe or secure. We don't know. Anyway, so these are some of the things, brother and sister, we wanted to mention very quickly. Um, that's 35 minutes so far. Inshallah, five more minutes. What we're going to describe is, in the time of Rasulullah Wasallam, then, in Medina Munawwara, two people reared their heads first. One of them was the father of Hanzala. Do you remember the hadith of the, 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 uh, the, the companion by the name of Hanzala? Hanzala. Hanzala, he was once with his family and they were having a good time. 
And then suddenly he thought, hold on. When I'm in the Prophet ﷺ's gathering and he speaks about Jannah, Jahannam, my faith is so high. And then when I come home and my, my family, I forget. I'm negligent. Hanzala, you are a munafiq. You are a hypocrite. You have one condition in the Prophet ﷺ's presence. When you go home, you're a totally different man. That's wrong. I need to go out and ask the Prophet about this. So Hanzala was a Muslim. Hanzala was a Muslim. And remember, he, on the way there, he meets Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Abu Bakr says, Hanzala, what are you saying? Because he's saying, Nafaqa Hanzala, Nafaqa Hanzala, Nafaqa Hanzala. Hanzala has become a munafiq. Abu Bakr anhu hears him while he's walking past. says, what's happened to you? Why are you saying this? He says, Abu Bakr, does this not happen to you? When you're with the Prophet, your iman is like this. And when you're with your family, you're just negligent, you're playing, you're having fun with your family. He says, yes. So that means I'm munafiq too. So let's go to the Prophet ﷺ and ask him about this. These are, subhanAllah, what I love about this story is the dilemma and the crisis in faith they had. That's what I love about it. We, we can laugh at the story and it's fine. Nothing wrong with that. We're not laughing at them. We're not laughing at the Sahaba. We find it humorous. But the Sahaba, they really faced a crisis in, a crisis, crisis in faith. How comes my iman is in different conditions? Or how comes I can't maintain that level of faith at all times? Does that not happen to you after Ramadan? Ramadan, your faith is like this. Because there's waves. There's waves like the oceans. Right? Sometimes the current is stronger than others. So Ramadan ends and we, everybody goes into this plateau, this sort of like burnout. Because we fasted, qiyam, taraweeh, everything. It's natural. Sometimes your Ramadan habits die down a little bit. The extra habits. The fara'id you still do. We still far, uh, pray our five, so on and so forth. So they go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they ask Rasulullah about this situation. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you're not munafiq. You're not munafiq. If your iman was like that all the time, the malaika would be saying salam to you while you're walking. Meaning you'd be in the company of the malaika. But that's very rare. It's very rare. And this was the same companion, Hanzala, radiallahu anhu, who is known to be Ghasilul Malaika. Ghasilul Malaika means the malaika washed him when he passed. Because he passed. How did he pass? He was a martyr. And he was unable to join before taking a ghusl. He had been intimate with his wife. The call came to go out and fight. He had to leave early. He wasn't able to take a bath. He passed away in the battle. He was a martyr, a shaheed. And the malaika washed him. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw that. Because what's the rule of the martyr? The martyr isn't washed. The martyr, the shaheed is not washed. The one who dies in battle. So he was a ghasil al-malaika. His father was a staunch enemy of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His father had actually become a Christian in his days of Jahiliyyah. And when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to uh, Makkah Mukarrama, sorry, Medina Munawwara, he didn't like Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his success in Badr. So when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi was successful in the battle of Badr, Muslims succeeded, that's when he started showing his true colors. So he, he came out and he started to uh, harm the Muslims in different ways. But it wasn't very clear that this person is a disbeliever. He was one of the people that dug a trench in the battle of Uhud. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fell in that trench and he injured himself. So this is how he schemed against the Muslims in that battle. And the second one, as I mentioned to you guys earlier, was Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul. He was a staunch munafiq. Now, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul... He showed rudeness to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to his tribe that was part of Khazraj. And there were a few people that were sitting around him. And when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrived in that gathering, the, he started to cover his nose with his cloth. He was trying to say, oh, your, your donkey that you rode on, O oh, Prophet of Allah. He didn't, want, he didn't call him Prophet of Allah. He said, your donkey that you rode on, it smells, move it away from me. 
That's how um, arrogant he was. He was so arrogant. So one of the companions sitting there, he said, the donkey of Rasulullah smells better than you. So this caused a bit of a ruckus, an altercation there. And then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to settle them down. After that, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to visit Sa'ad bin Ubadah radiallahu anhu. And Sa'ad bin Ubadah radiallahu anhu, who was the leader of a Khazraj, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him that from your tribe, Abdullah bin Ubay, he, he, he behaved like this. And, and he said, oh Rasulullah, leave him. Let him be. Fa'afu anhum wasfah. So there are verses of the Quran about this as well, like overlook it, turn the other way about this specific group. So this is something that we learn about um, from the people of Khazraj. Now, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was very wary of these people. And that's why it's mentioned that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, during the early Medinan years, he had gods. He said, I wish a righteous man guards my tent or guards my house. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu volunteered for this. And Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas was a Meccan companion. He was the first person to shoot an arrow for Islam. Awwalu man rama sahman fi sabilillah. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu. The first person to shoot an arrow in the path of Allah was Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu. So it's mentioned numerous narrations about Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Watching, even in Salah, at one time he looked towards a valley to see if there was any threat from the enemy. The Sahaba عنهم, stayed armed during the earlier years, meaning they had their weapons on them day and night because there was a threat. Now, none of this goes against tawakkul in Allah. That's the last thing that I want to end with. None of this goes against reliance and placing our trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. Taking the means and then placing our trust in Allah is the definition of tawakkul. And that's based on the hadith. A sahabi said, Oh Rasulullah, a companion said, Oh Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, should I tie my camel and then place my trust in Allah or should I leave it be, leave it untied and place my trust in Allah? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Tie your camel and place your trust in Allah. So tawakkul is a matter of the heart. You use the means Allah has made available to you. And then you place your trust in Allah. You take medication because Allah has put cure in it. But you understand that the cure comes from Allah. You use money. You eat. You drink. You use precautions. You lock your doors. You lock your car. If you think, I'm going to leave my car open because I'm going to pray salah. It might work in ISB because you have security guards but if you did that in London, your car will be robbed. Yeah. By the time you came back, your car's gone. In fact, if you just did that for a minute or two and you went into the convenience store or the shop, the uh, off-license, they call them, the news agents, you go there to just get a drink right, or a chocolate or whatever, you walk out, nine times out of ten, your car window might be smashed or, and your phone stolen or whatever you left in there. So it's not smart or wise, is it, to do that? That's not tawakkul, that's not trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. Okay? I'm going to end here, inshallah. May Allah Azza wa Jal allow us to understand. We're going to now speak about the battle of Badr is going to come. Right? So we're going to speak about that concept of struggle and war and jihad in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the concept in Islam, the levels, so on and so forth. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik wa nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin bi rahmatika ya rahman rahimin